Welcome to Backstage with Actors Training Ground. I'm your host, Tanner Lagoska. Today's guest is an accomplished artist whose love of music at an early age sparked his journey into the arts. He has experienced a broad range of roles throughout his career, actor, director, artistic director, musical director, adjunct faculty, and artist in residence. He has worked across the U.S. and overseas, including the Utah Shakespeare Festival, Nevada Conservatory Theater, Boston Pops Orchestra, Phoenix Theater, and the Walt Disney Theater in Japan. He composed the music for Lend Me a Tenor the Musical, Amelia Lost, Across the River, a musical based on the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, and many others. He continues to find success as a freelance director and musician. Please welcome Brad Carroll. Hi there. Hey, Brad, welcome. Good to see you after all these years. I know, right? I mean, it has been, I can't, well, well thank God I'm doing these episodes now because I'm getting to reconnect with people I have not seen in like 20 some odd years. It's, yeah. it's, it's incredible, you know? It's and yeah. I, I love it, I love it, you know? and. You were always one of my one of my favorite people when I was attending PCPA, so I had to have you on the show for yeah, sure. That's very kind of you to say. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I, you know, looking at your resume, Brad, I had no idea the stuff and, and what you accomplished, the, the writing, and, and, and where you've taught, and, and all that. It's, it's simply amazing. But I, I'm curious, where did all this start? I know that you started very young into music. Tell me about that. Well, I mean, where it actually came from, the short answer is, I don't know. I, when I look back on it, I just remember it happening. What I can tell you is, the inciting incident for me was when I was nine, so we're talking about 1965, um, all, the mu all the schools had music programs, and the instrument companies used to come on a tour of the schools, mm -hmm. and they would take over the multi-purpose room one night, open up all of the instrument cases, and the kids would come with their parents and pick an instrument that they might want to learn how to play. And then you could either rent the instrument, you could rent the instrument and then buy it, or you could just buy it outright. Well, my mom took me, I pointed at the tenor saxophone and said that one, and the man came over and sort of sized up the sax and me, and we were about the same size. <laughs> and he suggested the alto sax because it was smaller, Mm -hmm. So that's what I started on. And then I started going to band class, I don't know, two, three times a week. I don't really even remember learning the horn, learning how to read music for the first time. And it just became this thing that I was sort of, I felt comfortable in and was somewhat obsessed with. And so that's where everything began. I have the alto sax to blame for the fact that I'm in show business at all. <laughs> Did you experiment with any other instruments when you were growing up besides the alto sax? Later, I did. I think it was, may have been in seventh grade, and I had a, a, a band director who, I guess, saw something in me and asked me if I was interested in anything else. And I said, well, uh, maybe other woodwind instruments. And he said, well, why don't you start with the flute? Because the flute fingerings are almost exactly the same as the saxophone fingerings. Mm. So I didn't have to learn a whole new system. And then once I got that in my head, then I just wanted to learn all of the instruments, which by the end of high school, I had done just on my own. Just, wow. I, I, I don't know where that came from, why it happened, but I just thought, why not? Wow, wow. And I, had a, I had a great teacher who said, okay, yeah, just take this horn today. And he'd give me the horn and a fingering chart and I'd go home for a week. And I mean, I never became expert at any of them. I mean, the, the woodwinds, sax, clarinet, flute, bassoon, things like that are what I ended up thinking I was going to do for a living by the time I left high school. Very different. Um, right. But it was just great to have the knowledge of all these other things, which right. years, decades later, came in really handy yeah. when I became an orchestrator. So wow, funny how, funny how things line up. When I was when I was in uh, third grade or might have been second grade, I think I took up uh, violin. Uh, I studied for I think maybe a year, uh, and uh, you know I, I played a killer "Twinkle Twinkle Little Star." Let me tell you, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you, it was it was amazing. Um, you mentioned 1965 when you were nine years old. Uh, now here we are, 2021. How has the arts changed 
from oh, 1965 wow. to, to now? Because obvi obviously it has evolved. For you growing up in that time period and now here, what have you noticed? Well, um, first of all, back in 1965, there were arts in the schools. It was just part of every school's curriculum. You know, it was, it was a given. Band class, choir class, even drawing and painting classes and things like that. And, you know, I mean, the arts always seem to be a reflection of what's going on in the world. And to me now, now in 2021, the arts have become sort of political mm -hmm. and politicized, but the world has, you know, which I find a little bit distressing. Uh, and I'm happy to say that I made it through high school and into college before Proposition 13 happened in California and a lot of the arts education got canceled, got done yeah. away with. So I've been, I've been given a really solid foundation before it all went away. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, 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 the thing about artists is even when it gets rough, like right now, I think is probably is as rough as it's ever gotten in my lifetime mm -hmm. with the pandemic and everything. The artists always, they're like cockroaches. They always find a way to survive and keep, keep doing what they do. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Regardless of what the climate is, literally climate or political climate or whatever, they look for a way to adapt. Yeah. Um, I also noticed too, that artists seem to be the kind of people that will, will help each other when yeah. it gets rough. Normally we're on our own, but then when like during this pandemic, all of a sudden, you know, I find that theaters are, you know, more involved with other people in the, in the industry to help them. And like, for instance, I know that um, there's someone that I went to school with in Roosevelt. They were, I think they're a year behind me or two years behind me. Uh, and they're in Wisconsin now and they're doing a telethon for their, uh, nonprofit called uh, Arts for All Wisconsin. And she was looking for people to, um, you know, volunteer their talents for the telethon. And I said, I'll do it. And they've got people all over the uh, United States and in and, and, and Europe who are going to be, you know, donating their time to this. And I think that's so wonderful that artists yeah. are, are like that, where we, we really do, like, when, when it does come that time, we do pull together and, and, and join forces you know, yeah. to make it work, you right. know. Yeah. So. yeah, I think artists understand the us of it all, because you can't do it alone. Oh, no. You exactly. can't do it alone, you know. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, right. it's impossible. Yeah. Um, I know you started music when you were young. Mm -hmm. When your parents uh, were di got divorced, mm -hmm. did you find that that sort of pushed you more into the arts? Well, it's interesting, that's a great question, uh, because in retrospect, yes, but it's something that I didn't figure out until about 30 years later. Um, I think when, you know, there was trouble in the house, mm -hmm. and although the kids, the four of us, I mean, I was the oldest and I was nine, so there you go. My baby sister was two, so she has no memory of any of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew that there was a problem in the house and I think my saxophone became my, my solace, became my hideaway, mm -hmm. you know, that I could go to to sort of escape the, the tension when I could. You know, there were certain times where I had to be engaged in it, but, um, but again, I didn't realize that until I was in my 30s. And I looked back one day and I said, oh my gosh, look at that. The arts saved my life when I was nine and I didn't even realize it. So how did, so, so then the music you would say got you through the rough times. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I think, I agree. I, I think I, I was very alone as, a, as I was the only child growing up. I didn't have uh -huh. older sisters. And mm -hmm. I think that I used uh, a lot of, not acting, but a lot of pretending, you know, when I was younger. Mm -hmm to get through those times of, of just being alone and not having brothers and sisters. So I can see how, uh, how music could, could help you in, in that way. Uh, are any of your other brothers and sisters by chance involved in the arts? Not at all, nobody in my family. So I'm the anomaly. 
So you were you were into music uh, for most of your uh, adolescence, and then in high school you found theater. Uh, yeah. So it's, what did theater provide to you that music wasn't giving you? Well, honestly, I don't know that it was giving me something different, and it's kind of a funny story how I ended up in drama. It was my senior year. I had one more English credit I had to get to graduate. All that was left for me was American literature and drama. I didn't like reading when I was in high school, which is crazy because now I'm a voracious reader, but I didn't like reading. And I thought, I can't imagine spending a whole semester just reading books. Hmm. So I took a drama class and a lot of my friends were in it. And then one thing led to another and being in a play was suddenly this whole other thing that I understood because I would played in the orchestras for plays. I'd been part of them, but I'd never been on stage. And I liked it. You know, I mean, part of me, it was just my ego liked it because, you know, lots of really wonderful thing happened, th things happened in that one semester. Um, and again, a great teacher, the drama teacher at my little high school was just an awesome human being and just basically one of those people who just encouraged you to do things, didn't tell you what to do, didn't, you know, didn't play Lord and Master, just said, why don't you read this play and tell me what you think? You know, so yeah. then by the time I got to college, I was like, oh, drama is kind of interesting. How do I keep that with me while being a full time music major? And it was hard, but I found ways. Uh huh. You know, did you do any shows in high school? I did, I think, three two plays and a musical. Wow. You mentioned, I was reading your, uh, your resume and your CV, and you mentioned that. You went from top of the heap in high school to bottom of the heap in real life. And for those watching, can you please explain the difference between high school and the real world? Well, I'm gonna expand that a little bit. Um, for me, it's any sort of educational institution, whether it's high school, whether it's a four-year college, whether it's a two-year college, whether it's a two-year conservatory, whether it's a vocational training program, in, in those situations, you live in a bubble, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, when I was in conservatory, it was the same 12 kids every day, the same teachers every day for two years. And there's this, there's this separation from the larger world. And, you know, I was the top of the, I was like the best band guy, the best jazz band guy, the best, you know, I mean, in high school though, my, my high school had 625 people in it. So mm -hmm. it's not like going to a high school with 20,000 kids like some people do now. So I left with a certain feeling of, I got this. And then I got to college and there were 10, I was a bassoon major. Let me clarify. Why, I'm not really sure, but- I We all know. need more bassoons. I know, we do. Um, and there were 10 of us and I was number 10. Wow. And that, that was sort of shocking to me. Um, but what I've learned from that, and I now use in my teaching, is you know every, every year you get a couple of those kids who you go, oh, cream of the crop in high school. So they think they've got this. Mm -hmm. And I've found this really nice way to explain that once you're out of high school, you sort of have to reinvent yourself for the next adventure. Mm -hmm. And then you get through four years of college, as a senior, you're top of the, your high casting priorities, blah, 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 blah. Then you leave college and you're at the bottom again, even if you go to grad school, you know what I mean? It's this yeah. concept sort of having to reinvent, or not reinvent, but reassess where you are in relationship to. Right. The, the talent pool around you. Right, right. And just because it was that yesterday doesn't mean it's going to be that today because now mm. you're competing with, you know, if you come to PCPA, you're now competing for roles with professional actors. Right. Which right. you are not. You're right. an 18-year-old who just graduated from high school. And right. you're, yeah, you're really good. But you're not as good as Eric Stein. Right, right. You know what I mean? And exactly, a lot of them, exactly. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sobering moment when they realize, oh, I have to do this all over again? 
Mm -hmm. But if they can, they if they can absorb that and really turn it around in a positive way, it's the best possible way to learn. Yeah. So it's almost like you're saying, you know, still have the confidence, but check your ego at the door. Yeah, you have you know, to, because you're not going to be top banana, right? But that doesn't mean you're not good. It just means exactly. You it means you're it. now competing at a different level. Right. Right. You know, it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I have to say about that. And it was a great, you know, it was devastating to me at the time, but I thank the, the gods for it all the time, because I really do think looking at it and accepting it and starting a whole new way of working is what really became the foundation of, of how I operated in my career. Yeah, yeah. Just never it, not, just never thinking, I got this. Every time I met somebody new, I was like, oh God, I probably suck. I probably suck again. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's yeah. What, that's what I was made to feel like at 18, was that I just was not worthy anymore. Mm -hmm. So I now mm -hmm. knew what that felt like and knew that that's not what it was. It was just my perception of it. Right, right. You know, you know also, what I think it also affects you uh, too is, you know, who's teaching you? right yeah. Where you, who you're learning from and i know that you had a teacher a, a private teacher that that totally left a sour taste in your mouth um how did that teacher um affect you in your future choice in career well i gave up the bassoon <laughs> you know i did not go back to san francisco state for a second year i left college after a year because that, um, it was just so bad. I went, yeah, because I just thought I can't go back and do, I can't put myself through this for another three years. Mm -hmm. And my parents, thank God, said, well, what do you want to do? So I told them and they said, well, then that sounds like what you should probably go do. I had great parents, you know, and, um, but I mean, in retrospect, again, the lesson was somewhere deep inside me, I said, if I ever teach, I will never be that man. Do you think that, it, if I was, I mean, obviously I'm not in school, but let's say that I, I'm just starting school and I do have a teacher that just for some reason is making me lose the love or whatever the passion that I want to teach. What do you suggest people do? Because not everyone has the uh, ability to, to drop out of school. You know, some right. are sort of stuck in that because their parents say, you're doing this if you're Great. You know, yeah. how do we find that passion and how do we keep it? Well, uh, the thing that never occurred to me when I was 18 to do was to go to the head of the department and say, I'm having a really hard time. Mm -hmm. I just kept it all inside because I guess I thought it was probably, I really was bad. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? But, and I talked with some of my fellow students who were having a similar experience with this man. So we would commiserate, but we couldn't do anything about it. And, but again, we never took it to a higher power, but also education in those days was different. I mean, now that's the chain of command. Right. You take it to your supervisor, you know, you take it and that's just what you, you're expected to do. And people are more willing and able to do that in the climate now. But I don't know that at 18 that I thought I even had the power to complain in this exceptional music program. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was either do the work or go away. And so mm -hmm. I went away. Well, you know, good for you that you went away because it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have you here now. It changed you know? everything for me. It did, it did, it did. Well, listen, we're gonna take a small break, Brad. And when we come back, we will continue our interview with Brad Carroll. Thank you. At Actors Training Ground, we believe the foundation of great acting is quality training. Our goal is to teach the actor how to express emotions truthfully and honestly through connection to text, character, and movement. Many actors from Actors Training Ground have been signed by talent agents and featured in independent films, regional commercials, and national cable TV series. We can't promise fame and fortune, but we can guarantee comprehensive training from teachers passionate about the craft. So what are you waiting for? Visit us at ActorsTrainingGround.com and see what we have to offer you.
Actors Training Ground. Explore the possibilities. Stage with Actress Training Ground. I'm your host, Tanner. Our special guest today in the spotlight is Brad Carroll. So, Brad, you were at SFSU for a year before you left, and you en ended up going to PCPA for uh, for the two-year conservatory artist program. Uh -huh. um, what was the conservatory like compared to the collegiate aspect from SFSU? Well, the biggest difference was just the size of the program. You know, I mean, when I was at San Francisco State in 1974, there were 25,000 people at that college. That was bigger than any town I had ever lived in. Wow. <laughs> and so coming to PCPA, which I had grown up going to see their shows, so I was familiar with how it worked. You know, I suddenly found myself in a class with 12 other people. And those were the people I dealt with every day. And the teachers were working professionals, as, as has always been the way at PCPA. And, uh, so it was, the, the whole focus was different. It was professional training as opposed to educational training. And the, mm -hmm. one isn't necessarily better than the other, but it's the focus uh, that I found um, both exhilarating and a little bit intimidating because at San Francisco State, you could kind of get lost if you wanted to. Yeah. You get lost in a class of 100 people. At yeah. PCPA, there was no getting lost. Yeah, no, there's nowhere to hide. Yeah, you were you were you were you know you were exposed in, in the best possible sense of the word at all times, and that was a little bit of a jolt at first, for me, um, but ended up being, you know, I remember asking myself, why didn't I come here to begin with? Right. You right. know, but as I said before, I had thought music was going to be the focus of my life. I was going to be a professional woodwind player, mm -hmm. and then suddenly I decided I want to be an actor. And I came yeah. to the place because I was raised in this area. So PCPA was just, you know, 20 miles from where I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, so it seemed like the logical choice for me and ended up to be another life changing choice. Right. That I could not have known was going to be life changing. Were, were there any people that were influential or inspired you, when, uh, to, you know, as an actor or as a musician or as a director or teacher? Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a list of them that I won't bore you with the whole list. But I mean, my original mentor was my high school band director, mm -hmm. um, who just basically turned me loose in the department and said, you do whatever you want, because I don't think he'd ever met a high school kid who was as motivated as I was. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I got to PCPA thinking I'm going to leave music behind. I played the piano a little bit, but I'd never studied the piano. I just kind of dabbled on my own. And there was a woman at PCPA, Beth Miller was her name, and she taught, she was the voice teacher. And um, she became my next mentor. And she's the one who said, well, if you take your musical ability and your theater ability and combine them, you could look into becoming a music director in addition to being an actor. Yeah. And I had, that had never occurred to me. And then I later found out that if you play the piano, people automatically assume that you are a music director and a composer. And you know what I mean? Whether you are or not, they just make that assumption. So that shifted me again. So when I left PCPA two years later, I didn't want to be an actor. I wanted to be a music director. So my career so far has gone like this. Like a zigzag, yeah. A total zigzag. Uh, and um, then that's what launched the next phase for me was her, her belief in me and the opportunity she gave me while I was there. From, from 79 to 85, you were between California and New York and in and, and, and between. Um, what were some of the struggles that you encountered during that time? Because I'm sure it hasn't been all a bed of roses. No, I, I mean, I've, again, I, I can't repeat enough times how lucky I have been 
mostly with people I have known. Um, but up until 79, my career had been very local here. I went to PCPA, I left PCPA and went right to work for the Great American Melodrama, which is just right down the road. Mm -hmm. I was with them until 79, um, uh, being a music director and a, and a performer and really learning how to do that by having to crank out a show every six weeks. And then I was working with a stage manager there who stage managed at a summer stock theater in New York, in upstate New York. And she said, we're looking for a music director conductor. So I sent my resume in and got hired sight unseen based on Nancy's recommendation. And the big leap for me was I'd never been to the East Coast. <laughs> and I just got on a plane and went and walked into this summer theater company and took over the music department. And, and then they had me back for the next four summers after that. So that sort of became my home base. My best friends in New York are the people I met there that first summer to this day. We just had a big Zoom meeting about three weeks ago, you know, to say hi to one another. Um, and again, it was a bit of a leap of faith on my part. But, but, the, but, but after that summer, the first summer, I moved to New York City. You know, little hick from Indiana suddenly finding himself in the middle of New York City. Mm -hmm. That was scary. It was yeah. exhilarating and it was scary. And I didn't ever work in New York City. Oh, okay. I took, I got a lot of jobs out of town as a lot of people do. So I found myself subletting an apartment almost all the time for, for the better part of five years. But the scariest part is just getting a foothold. Yeah. You know, because you got to pay the rent. Mm hmm making sure there's a job to make sure you can pay your bills and eat, you know? And that was the biggest shock for me because up until then, it had all been handed to me. You love music, obviously. It's been part of your life yep. tremendously. So music is your first love and then acting would be your second. Where does directing fall into this? Well, uh, that's just another interesting story. Um, I, I had come to PCPA I come, after I left as a student, I came back eight years later as a staff member to be the assistant musical director for the company. Okay. And so I'd been there for about nine months and the man who was the artistic director had been one of my teachers when I had been there in the 70s, uh, Jack Schaus. And he, he stopped me in the hall one day and said, I think you should direct. And I said, okay, what does that even mean? Jack. I mean, I knew what being a director was because I'd been in a lot of plays, but I'd never done it myself. Right. And I, and I, and he said, come to my office later. So I went and saw him later in the day thinking he was going to send me with four people to the Rotary Club to do a little quartet thing. And he wanted me to put it together and run it. He says, I want you to direct the holiday show, which was Cinderella the first time we did it in 1986. And, and, and I said, okay, and here's an example of a great mentor. He said, I'm not gonna be there breathing down your neck. As a matter of fact, I'm not gonna be there at all. But if you need help, call me and I'll come in. Did so he just him? turned me loose directing a great big book musical, which is something I had never done before. Gave me great people to work with. He designed the set, you know, mm -hmm. and it went really well. So after that, I was given another show. Mm -hmm. And it went well. And then I was given another one. And with, within about two years, I was actually directing more than I was music directing. So it, again, it's just something that happened to me. I said, yes, I was shaking in my boots the whole time. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, telling my teachers what to do was weird. As a teacher, did you learn from your students? Oh, always. I think most of what I know I learned from my students. You know, because I, again, I'll just throw this out there. I never finished college. I don't have any degrees. You know, I've been one of those sort of life learner types. Mm -hmm. um, and I found out, I mean, what I learned was when I started teaching is really when I started learning about theater. Mm -hmm. Because to have to articulate it rather than just do it 
especially to people who are just beginning to grasp it. You know, it's a different, it's a different language form. It's a different heart place. It's a different everything than yeah. just doing it yourself. And, and you know, when, when I started teaching, I was 29. My students were only like eight or nine years younger than me. You know, it's a, now it's a big, much bigger gap, but right. there was just, I don't know, there was just something in learning how to articulate it that made me get even clearer in my own head about what the heck I was doing. You know, I yes. never, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just, I don't I was think going, I, I was going, like, yes. I never felt like the Lord of knowledge mm -hmm. in my classroom. I mean, certainly I knew more, but it didn't mean I knew how to articulate it until I was asked, you know? So, oh yeah, I mean, the students have been a huge part of my learning curve. So after you left PCPA, uh, in 2005, something really amazing happened. You wrote the music for Lend Me a Tenor the Musical. Now, I actually saw the play at Solvang when they did it for PCPA when it was not a musical. It was just a straight play. Yeah, just a play, yeah. Right. Uh, so I'd love to hear how, first of all, how did the idea come about? Hey, let's write a musical. And then how long did it actually take for the process? Okay. Well, again, this is another one of those crazy, I can't believe this even happened stories. But my writing partner, Peter Sham, um, who teaches at Southern Utah University, who I met as an actor at the Utah Shakespeare Festival in 2002. We hit it off immediately. In 2004, we wrote a Christmas piece for the Shakespeare Festival to be able to do at Christmas, which is something they'd never done. They wanted to sort of extend for the community into Christmas. So he and I wrote this piece called A Christmas Carol on the Air. And the founder of the festival was in it, playing Scrooge. Um, and about two weeks into rehearsal, he was hearing the music and reading the script and the jokes and the gags and the structure and everything. And he, one night after rehearsal, he said, you guys, I'm really liking this. So what do you think about writing a musical for the festival? And when it's ready, we'll produce it. I mean, a full musical. And I mean, how often does that happen? Right? Right. So we went right to work trying to come up with a, a piece. You know, we thought we'll start in the public domain and see if there's some great classic piece that wants to be adapted. And then one night, uh, and this, the idea came in the parking lot outside the theater in Cedar City. Peter said, you know, I'm acquainted with Ken Ludwig. I'm going to email him and ask him what he would think about Lemmy Tenor being a musical. And I said, well, you're crazy. I said, I'll bet Cantor and Ebb and every composer on Broadway has been knocking on his door for 20 years. So yeah, you write to him if you want to, but I, it's hopeless. The next day, we get an email from Ken going, hey, fellas, you know what? I never thought of it. So let's talk about it. It sounds like a great idea. That was in October of 2004 in 2005 in February, we signed the option agreement with him, which gave us two and a half years to fully produce it at the festival in order to maintain our copyright, uh, you know, rights. Right. And so we cranked for two and a half years on this musical and the, and the festival produced it. And uh, Ken came to see it and liked it. And what we didn't expect was two producers, three producers from New York came to see it based on the title alone. Because Lemmy a Tenor, the play, was the most produced play in America for about 20 years. Wow, I didn't know that. So these producers were like, that's a great play. How does it work as a musical? And then one thing led to another, and to keep the story short, we ended up kind of doing a bidding war with these producers who wanted to take it and move it forward, like into the commercial world. And we found, we, we went with the producer that we thought we were most simpatico with, um, who was actually somebody I actually had known before and worked with, um, Martin Platt. And uh, then there were some snags along the way, as there are often in showbiz. Um, 
and then we ended up taking it to London. We were, we were, we were heading to Broadway and roadblocks kept happening. And I was ready to give up at this point. I was so tired of it. And Martin said, give me 24 hours. And the next day he said, how do you guys feel about taking it to London and opening it over there? Well, sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's what we did. Wow. So, and, but from the, time, from the time of the idea, in I think it was October of 2004, it was June of 2011 when it opened in the West End. So that's a little less than seven years, which typically is how long it takes for a musical from the idea to a first class production, if it ever even gets one. So again, luck, lucky, lucky, lucky. Lucky, lucky for sure. The other thing I want to emphasize is that Peter and I didn't say, let's write a show that'll go to Broadway. We right. said, let's see if we can make a really good musical out of this really funny play. We never had any notion of it going beyond the Utah Shakespeare Festival, except maybe getting it in a catalog somewhere. Well, I got to say, congratulations, Brad. I think that's a great accomplishment and, you know, well, it was, you know, it's, yeah, well, truly the highlight of my career to, to date. How does an artist deal with self-doubt in a business that clearly validation is not always provided? Well, the short answer to that is just if, if you don't know how, you better figure it out. You know what I mean? And it's, you, you, you know, I go back to all the famous pundits of the 19th century. You have to, you have to know yourself and you have to trust yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, and the pro the, I think that one of the big problems in, in the business is we are, we are programmed to compare ourselves to others. And I think that's the root of the problem. Right. I'm not as good as fill in the blank. Right. And, but the reality of that statement is you are not her. Right. So why are you even trying to be? Right. Right. Because you know what? She's insecure too. She just doesn't seem insecure because she's famous. Right. You know, and, and, and but, the, but the flip side of that is I think it's, I think it's important. Because being, I mean, I call it, you know, I, for me, I call it how neurotic I am about my own work, which is just sort of encompasses the whole thing. I think that self-doubt and that insecurity is what keeps me honest in the work. Does that make sense? I have this conversation yeah. with one particular friend all the time, and we are both directors, and we are both equally neurotic about our work, and we never think what we do is quite good enough. And I think it's why we keep working, why we are always striving because, so if you can turn the fear into fire, <laughs> you know, I just made that up. That was not a planned thing. I mean, yeah, if you can turn that negative fear into a forward moving fire to, to, to do the best work you know how to do, that action in and of itself helps put the self-doubt to the side. Yeah. And I think if, if every project is, oh my gosh, here's another one of those fear into fire moments. Yep. But I know what that is now, so I know how to do this, as opposed to collapsing every time you're given a project that you feel like you're not worthy of. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. it doesn't have to be that way. Right. Well, those are great words of, of advice for a lot of people out there who are watching this. Uh, we're going to take a small little break, and when we come back, we will finish up our interview with Brad Carroll in the spotlight with Backstage with Actors Training Ground. At Actors Training Ground, we believe the foundation of great acting is quality training. Our goal is to teach the actor how to express emotions truthfully and honestly through connection to text, character, and movement. Many actors from Actors Training Ground have been signed by talent agents and featured in independent films, regional commercials, and national cable TV series. 
We can't promise fame and fortune, but we can guarantee comprehensive training from teachers passionate about the craft. So what are you waiting for? Visit us at actorstrainingground.com and see what we have to offer you. Actors Training Ground. Explore the possibilities. Stage with Actors Training Ground. Our guest today in the spotlight is Brad Carroll. Brad, so after 15 years of success in different ways in the entertainment industry, you returned back to PCPA to teach again. What brought you back a second time? Well, first of all, it was PCPA, my artistic home, and to be invited back was a real honor. And on a more pragmatic and practical level, I basically had been on the road for 15 years. You know, there were about eight of those years where I didn't have a place to live. I mean, I was always living, you know, I go to direct someplace and they give you a place to live and a car. So I spent about eight years using my writing partner's home address just so I would have an address. And and as much as I love the variety, which is what freelancing is all about to me, you know, just the variety of people in theaters, I got offered this position and just thought, maybe it's time to come off the road and actually sleep in the same bed every night for a while and just, you know, and, and give up the sort of gypsy life that I was enjoying. And as I said, it was PCPA. And so I knew what I was walking into. I knew about the quality. I knew about the integrity. I knew about the expectations. And <clears throat> so it was pretty easy to say, I would love to do that. Do you think that, could you just mention freelancing and how it's, you know, it, it, it's like gypsy style of, of living because you don't know where your next job's coming from and you're bouncing from here and there. Um, out of curiosity, what do you, what do you prefer? Do you prefer freelancing or do you prefer having a steady job? Well, I prefer having a steady paycheck <laughs> more than a steady job. I mean, I think the, the freelancing is more appealing to me. I, and why? I'm not sure. Just the, the free spirit. I would, I would guess that because you're not doing the same thing every time, most likely. One time you'll be you know, musical directing. One time you'll be actually just directing. One time you might be acting. One time you might be composing. So like the freelancing, because you, you, you're so talented and have so many things that you can dip into, I think mm -hmm. the freelancing is more appealing because you're not stuck to one thing only for, you know, right. three months or five years or whatever the case may be, you know? Yeah, yeah. That, That's and, what I think and, for sure. And the same thing, I mean, that was what was always so appealing to me about PCPA is I got to do all of those things, but you're doing it under one roof, you know, with the same group of people all the time, the same designers on the same stage. And, and there's great joy and comfort in that. But there's something about the wanderlust yeah. You know, about working in different companies, working for companies I've never worked for before, showing yeah. up to direct a show, having never met the actors. Mm -hmm. There's, there's just, you know, there's the fear factor in that, yeah. that, that I just find really exhilarating and, uh, and, just, and plus the opportunity just to network with more people yeah. who I didn't know before I walked in there. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a 50, 50 for me. I think that's why I liked doing children's theater because I toured around so much and I saw so many states and so many cities, big and small. And it, I love that idea of like just driving for eight hours, stopping at this next city, staying there for three days in a hotel, you know, doing the shows and then off to the next, you know, and there's yeah. something about that, that, that was very just, mesmerizing and fulfilling and just exciting 
and yeah. just meeting new people and new cultures yeah. just from the different states and cities alone, you know, was simply amazing. You have done many shows. You've acted in many shows. You've directed many shows. You've physically directed many shows. I know it's going to be a hard question for you, Brad, but if you had to pick one or two of your favorite oh, roles God. or shows, <laughs> I know, I know, it's a terrible question. Which mm. would you pick? Which have been just so, like, you'll never forget ever? Um, well, I think actually, I got, I had the opportunity recently, about four years ago now, to direct Lend Me a Tenor, the musical, which I had never done. I'd watched other people direct it, you know, around the country and in England. And uh, PCPA decided to do it and, and asked me if I, if I thought I could direct it or was I too close to it. And by now it had been six or seven years since we'd done it. Mm -hmm. And there was something really unique in getting to look at something I had written from a completely different viewpoint. I mean, there were things that the music director would play something and I would literally turn to him and say, is that how that goes? <laughs> I wrote it. <laughs> and I couldn't remember exactly how it went. So there was just sort of a, the, the, it was the uniqueness of getting to do that, I think, that made it really, really special. And Eric Stein was in it and he was a scream and Kitty Bailey was in it. You know, all my favorite people were in it. Acting wise, that's really hard. Um, um, I think maybe, I mean, the one that always comes to mind for me was, and this was 24 years ago, I got to play Fagin in Oliver, and Roger Delorier directed it. This was at PCPA, and there was just something so special about playing that guy under Roger's direction with the, with the you know, the students and the, and, and the other ARs in, involved that... I've, I've never quite let go of that. And I would love to do it again now, if I could even get through it at my age. But you know what I mean? It's one of those that, have, that just always stuck with me, of all things, Fagin and Oliver, you know, not Hamlet, not any of those big, big ballbuster roles that I never played. Um, and, uh, and as a music director, I think, and this is gonna sound really crazy, this was in Summerstock. I was 26 years old, West Side Story, because I had, I had an orchestra in the orchestra pit in this summer stock company that was judged to be the best pit orchestra in the state of New York outside of Manhattan. I had the, the most amazing pit orchestra for West Side Story, wow. and it's one of my favorite scores, and to get to do it with real top-notch musicians you know, it was just, I mean, it's just going to work every night. I couldn't wait to get there. So, Brad, do you think that it's ever too late to gain success in theater? I do not. One of the things I tell my students all the time, because they all think if they're not a Broadway star by the time they're 22, that they have failed. But there's no timeline. And I have a great story to illustrate that. A, a, a man who was a resident artist when I was a student at PCPA in the 70s, his name is Dennis Arndt. He was a big regional actor. He was at Oregon Shakespeare uh, Festival for years and years and years. At 77, got his first Broadway show about four years ago. Wow. Yeah. And it had a perfectly, perfectly wonderful career. He'd done some film, but he'd never done Broadway. And I'm not even sure it was even on his radar. So I use that as, as an example in teaching, going, see, what's, what's the rush? You know, oh, so. Unfortunately in this world too, Brad, you know, because of social media and our cell phones, everything is now a now society. Oh, right? I want it instant yeah. gratification. I want it now. And they don't want to put the work into it, <laughs> which is a shame because when we were growing up, cause I mean, we're, I didn't realize I was only nine years apart from you. Uh -huh. I didn't realize how, how, how we were in the same, almost in the same age range. Uh, but, you know, we grew up where we had to search for the jobs. We had to find these auditions. We had to do the work. It wasn't you go online and click and see a group that says, hey, auditions in the triangle area, right? right. We had to actually do the work. And I think that a lot of kids 
because of the of the computer and because of the cell phone that the instant it's me 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 i i i now 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 and it's, it's yeah. so, so sad because that doesn't really fit sometimes with the way life works <laughs> it's not you know i mean people ask me all the time are you on instagram and i said i don't do anything that has insta in the title <laughs> I don't oh, need I Instagram, Instagram in my life anymore. You know yeah, what I mean? I use Instagram is when I, I post something for an email and I'll, I, I have it go to my Instagram of yeah. what my email. I get out. it. I get it. I just don't, I don't, that's, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and I don't fault anybody who does. It's, it's a thing right now. Yeah. But and I in, a, in a few years, we're going to laugh about how dumb Instagram was. Oh yeah. Uh, it's just going to be something to social media was, hopefully. Yeah. Um, if you could go back, and give your younger self a piece of advice. Brad, what would it be? Oh my goodness. I guess it would be, I mean, because everything I've said today makes me sound like I was the bravest soul on earth. And I wasn't, I was, I was terrified most of the time. Um, is just to be, be bold. And as we've talked about, be willing to fail. Yeah. Because a failure is actually a success if you allow yourself to learn something. And there's such a stigma on failing nowadays, especially. But I mean, yeah, be bold and don't be afraid to fall on your face and get up and start again. Awesome. Well, we've come to this part of the program, Brad, where I get to pay tribute to James Lipton. He was the host for Inside the Action <laughs> Studio. And he passed away this year. Uh, uh -huh. Uh, so mm -hmm. what I'm doing is I'm take, I'm, I took a hybrid. I took some of his questions and took some more questions that I want to ask and put them together for my own 10 questions. Oh gosh. Yes. So, um, so don't be nervous. Mm -hmm. be, it'll be fine. So I'm going to ask you, uh, these are, these are one word answers or maybe a, a sentence or two, but nothing too long. Okay. Uh, but basically, and you can have time to think about it. I mean, you know, don't think about it too long, but. You know, right. I, want, I want you to have yeah. some, some really good, you know, solid answers here. But here are the, the, the final 10 questions. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> Brad, what is your favorite sound? Silence. What is your least favorite sound? Traffic noise. What scares you? Oh, um, what scares me? Uh, Oh, well, okay. I'll, I'm, I'm going to take a deep breath and I'm going to say stupid people. <laughs> what brings you joy? Gardening. What is your favorite swear word? Fuck. What has acting taught you? That we are all the same part of the same organism. If anything, what is your biggest regret? Oh. I think, and this goes back to something I just said a second ago, not being braver as a young person. What do you consider your strongest trait? My ability to see two sides of an argument. And what do you consider to be your weakest trait? My ability to see two sides of an argument. <laughs> and then finally, what do you want to be remembered for? Oh, wow. I think inspiring people through my actions. Awesome. Brad, I want to thank you so much for taking out time out of your schedule for this for this episode. Uh, I appreciate you so much and just want to thank you again for your time. This was fantastic, Tanner. Thank you so much. Well, this has been Backseat with Actress Training Ground. I'm Tanner Lagascar. Our guest today in the spotlight was Brad Carroll. Until next time, explore the possibilities. Hey.